I'm a little nervous now. I'm a little nervous because I've already seen the first standing ovation for the day, and it wasn't for me, so it's only going to go downhill from here. <laughs> uh, but I, I have to tell you, though, I think it was very classy, um, Patty, for you to share that about the Strands, and it's been great getting to know them and getting to know this organization over the last several months. Uh, before we get started, I want to share a passage. Um, I, I do a lot of reading, and I don't know if we have any readers here, but you'll understand in a few minutes why I'm reading this particular book, but I was reading a book called The Art of Raising a Puppy, and there was a passage in it that really struck me as appropriate for our particular conference today. <clears throat> in our view, the dog is not a possession, a personal, personal commodity to be used solely for our own amusement or ego gratification. Rather, he is a living, autonomous, yet highly social, pack-oriented creature who has an amazing capacity for companionship and love. Isn't that a wonderful passage? It, it struck me because I think it applies to a basic question that we have to answer as a society, not just we in this room, but as a society. What is the role of animals in our life and our society? And perhaps more importantly, who gets to determine that role and the rules that apply to that role? Now, that passage is wonderful and it strikes me because I live with a dog now uh, that is a true companion. I grew up on a farm, as you'll see in a minute, and as a, a farm kid, dogs were working parts of our lives. They did not live in the home, but they were part of our families nonetheless. They were outdoor animals, we were a livestock operation, and so that kind of formed some of my first uh, opinions about animals, how we treated our livestock, how we treated our working dogs. And now that I uh, am no longer at the home farm, live with a companion dog as part of our house, part of our family. One of the challenges that we have is that delineation between that kind of anthropomorphization that we have of, of animals as people versus animals as property. And I think we have to define a role somewhere that's in the middle. Okay, so now you've gotten a brief philosophical lesson before the speech ever starts. Okay, I'll give you a little bit of background on myself. Like John Cougar Mellencamp, I was born in a small town, though not in the same small town. In fact, my small town, the only town east of the Mississippi River to have two livestock auctions within the city limits. That may or may not mean anything to you, but I thought it was a heck of a claim to fame growing up as a, as a wannabe cowboy on a small cow-calf operation. I was a member of a high school youth organization known as the FFA. Some would know it as the Future Farmers. Didn't I look dashing in blue corduroy? <laughs> that was like 25 years and at least 100 pounds ago. As I mentioned, I grew up on a small farm, and, and I mean that uh, literally 120 acres. Uh, my little brother and I, Grandma and Grandpa, raised five kids on that farm. Uh, my, my area of passion was livestock. This is one of my cows. Now, she's no longer with us. In fact, I, I'm completely out of the cattle business now, but for a lot of years, this is what I did. I traded that in, however, for a lifestyle in the suburbs. After being a lifelong farm kid, I raise grass for a living now. Well, maybe not for a living. <laughs> And I guess you have to be careful saying that now. You can actually raise grass for a living in some of the parts of the world west of the Mississippi, especially after Tuesday night's election, I guess. So I'll, I'll have to, to retrain that, uh, rewrite that line. I live on a street with a bunch of retirees in $200,000 homes. I'm the only non-retiree in my little neighborhood. We have a little horseshoe-shaped street. And so I have to keep up with these guys. And for the one, Frank's my buddy. Frank's at the end of the street, uh, retired Marine. Moses yard every third day, whether it needs it or not. Waters every other day, whether it needs it or not. His grass is immaculate, and I, I love him and hate him dearly all at the same time. <laughs> okay, so I'm this suburban farm kid. Let's talk about the things that we share in common. I grew up on a cattle ranch. I can tell we have a lot of dog enthusiasts here. And now I have a new goal in, the li in life, and that's to make friends with the circus people in the back of the room, because, God, I really want to get behind the scenes and play with the elephants. I just... <laughs> If, if this conference accomplishes nothing else, let's make that happen. <laughs> As I mentioned, dogs were farm dogs growing up. I'd never been to a dog show. I thought dog people were kind of crazy in the way I think horse people are kind of crazy. And now that I'm a dog person, I can say that and you all can't really throw things at me because I'm your brand of crazy now too. <laughs> My wife is something, um, you, you use the term hobby breeder, she's a hobby trainer. She's really good, like dog whisperer kind of good, maybe better. 
And she just does it because she loves the dogs. She started with Dash. This is our Norwegian elk hound. He's doing, uh, working on the second leg of his, his utility title. Um, they don't call it futility for a reason. He's an elk hound. He loves to jump. He doesn't like to do a lot of the other things you have to do in utility. So we're still working on legs two and three. Hopefully, before I die, he will achieve that title. Dash, really good. Uh, this picture with my wife. Ain't she pretty? This is at our national regional specialty. She did, she did win um, their, I think, both the rally classes in our national regional specialty, which was really kind of cool. And there we are, happy family. Oh, go ahead, say it. Aww. Yeah, thank you. That's why I put that picture in there. This, this is my little buddy to be. He is uh, nine weeks old, and, and next Saturday we're going to go and pick him up uh, from the breeder. I'm really, really excited. This is Rody. Uh, yeah, thank you. So. And because who doesn't love puppy pictures, there's another shot of Rody. I just, I can't wait. Um, this is going to be our first show dog, I guess you'd say. Dash uh, is, is a, an obedience dog only, but I decided that as a kid who grew up showing cattle, I kind of was into the whole confirmation show thing on, well, on four much larger feet. I, maybe I'd be ready to give it a shot on four much smaller feet and see if, uh, see if that's a, a fun and interesting hobby. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hopefully have now successfully established that we have a lot in common and we can start from a base of shared values for our discussion. I want to give you this other little glimpse into my world. My thought process and patterns and view of the world are changing. Uh, and they're changing, if you can tell the items in this picture have something in common. They're all going to belong to uh, new parents and a little baby girl come February. My wife and I are expecting our first child. and. Okay. <laughs> The validation I'm getting from this audience is great. I hadn't even sworn you in yet. Um, I was going to swear you in and make you promise to cry at the appropriate parts, laugh at the appropriate parts, get the jokes, even if you didn't actually get them to pretend you got them. But you're, you're all just right on cue. I won't even have to swear you in. I don't know how clearly you can see this picture or not, but I love this. These are little be, like little bejeweled baby uh, sock booty things. The ones on your left have the Block WV logo of West Virginia University. My wife is a huge Mountaineer fan. On this side, we have the Block O of The Ohio State University, the greatest university in the known universe. And, and, and here's the kicker. Um, at this point, it is perfectly logical and safe for me to say that we are the only football team in the country to be 10-0. That, that may change later this afternoon since we don't play and everyone else does, but today and today only at least, we're the only school in the country 10 and 0. Let's talk about agriculture. That's what we're really here to hear from me about. My first job as an agricultural journalist was in radio. WRFD AM in Columbus, Ohio was a Christian Bible teaching radio station that did two hours of farm programming a day. And I started at age 20 as the farm director, farm broadcaster, leading that program covered 80 out of Ohio's 88 counties. Ohio is a very interesting state. A lot of urban areas, Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, Dayton, Toledo, Youngstown, et cetera, et cetera. There are 14 television markets in the state of Ohio. And yet, Ohio is also one of the top 10 agriculture states in the country. Agriculture is our number one industry, and one in seven Ohioans earns a living as part of Ohio's food and agriculture sector. Really an amazing interface between rural and urban. I write today for Feedstuffs, the weekly newspaper for agribusiness. We're a national agricultural trade journal targeted primarily to the feed and livestock sectors. You've heard of those giant corporate factory mega farms, those evil SOBs, right? Those are the kind of people I write to and write about and the people who support and serve them within the agribusiness sphere. So this kind of gives you some window, even though I grew up in a small town, a lot of my professional work deals in big ag, as our detractors will often call it. I want to share some other shared values that we have. The, the infographic you see here on the screen came from the U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance. This term alliance is really important today. NAIA, USFRA, there's a group called the Animal Ag Alliance I've worked with. Everybody wants to start aligning ourselves with others who share our values and interests. USFRA, as part of their Food Dialogues program, surveyed over 2,400 consumers and more than 1,000 farmers and ranchers just a little over a year ago and found that consumers are thinking about food, but they don't know much about where it comes from. Farmers and ranchers share a lot of the same values. Farmers and ranchers know there is a divide, and consumers are firmly divided on issues related 
to food production in the modern era. At the same time, we have more in common, perhaps, than we think. You'll see on one side what farmers and ranchers think are most important for consumers to be thinking about. At the same time, you'll see the topics consumers want in for more information about. Look at how closely they align. We're going to talk about these different areas of interest and how we see things differently. Part of the survey, farmer and rancher survey, this is what farmers and ranchers think about consumers, how much knowledge you think the average consumer has about modern farming, and at the same time, how accurate is the consumer's perception of modern farming. That old saying, perception is reality, really has a strong basis of truth in the discussions we're going to have this weekend and moving forward about defining that role for animals in our society in this brave new world. We're going to play a little game called Factor Folly, or, or uh, one of the local radio stations in the Columbus market will play this game. They call it Factor Crap. I thought that was a little crass, so we just called it <laughs> Factor Folly. But this is, this is just a handful of issues about how consumers and farmers think differently. And it's important, I think, for you to understand the different sides of a single issue. This issue, biotechnology, specifically genetic, genetically modified organisms. On the one hand, consumers have a perception that GMO food, dangerous and unhealthy, bad, bad, danger, Will Robinson, danger. Farmers, on the other hand, would tell you that the products are no different, nutritionally or chemically, biotech, non-biotech. All right, biotech bad for the environment, you know, think Soylent Green, something like that. On the other hand, farmers will tell you that biotech reduced CO2 emissions by a staggering amount, meanwhile removing an equivalent of 6.5 million cars from the road for an entire year. There are a lot of reasons for that. I won't get into the engineering behind why that's the case, but it has to do things like the number of times a farmer has to drive a tractor back and forth across a field, how many times he has to apply a chemical to get rid of pests or herbicides. Biotechnology and using genetic manipulations allowed us to make the plant do a lot of things itself that the farmer used to have to do through synthetic means or, or even organic means uh, using organic fertilizers, herbicides, and so on. When we can engineer the plant to do it better itself, we have to do less in the environment throughout the growing process. Biotechnology, unproven, new science, and new science is dangerous. Well, at the same time, we've been doing genetic engineering in one stripe or another for a millennia. It's not new science, we're just doing new things with the scientific principles we've honed over the years, generations, centuries, and beyond. We're able to do now more with less. In 1960, one farmer produced enough food for 30 people. That's not even half the room here. Today, on the other hand, one farmer produced enough food for 155 people. Huge improvement in really just a generation. I mean, massive shifts. Let me give you another example. 81% more poultry per dirt, 176% more pork per sow, with fewer sows, by the way. More corn on fewer acres, more soybeans on fewer acres. We are doing more with less, and not just on a small scale. We're doing more with less on a staggering scale. One thing we are not making any more of in this, in this planet is land. The land mass that we have dedicated to farming and food production is not getting any bigger. We're just changing the way we use those same resources. With that in mind, let's think about what I call the credibility gap. How consumers hear various messages that we use in agriculture. And you'll understand why what sounds perfectly good to a farmer who is based in science, fact, truth, reality, objectivity, as he sees them, has a heck of a time communicating with a consumer audience that knows very little about science and fact and truth and non-emotion based rhetoric, okay? We say our methods are proven safe. We are the industry that relies on the land-grant university system. If a scientist at Ohio State tells it is so, we take him at his word because he is a respected individual in his field with far more expertise than we have. We take the experts and we run with them. We've based so much of our, of our fight, I guess, for consumer perception on science. But the consumer says we don't know if they're safe in the long term. GMOs, for example. No instances of anyone anywhere ever getting sick 
or contracting some strange mutation or disease from consuming genetically engineered foods. But the consumer says, we don't know if they're safe long term. So what that you've done a 10 year, 15 year study? What if I eat this stuff for 60 years? Am I all of a sudden going to glow in the dark? On the other hand, we keep food affordable. We in agriculture, very big on the whole affordable food supply thing. Consumers don't care because they assume cheap food is cheap. Farms are family run, yeah, but most farms are somewhere beholden to the big boys. Doesn't matter that Andy has 120 acres and two dozen cows. They assume that somewhere some big guy is putting his thumb on me, making me do his bidding. We care about our land and animals. Consumers say yes, but you'll take shortcuts to put an extra dollar in your pocket. We need to produce more feed to food the world. Yeah, but you want to sell more food to put more money in your pocket. It's always back to the cynical side of what the conversation is. Agriculture, the reason for our abundant food supply, but so what? An abundance of unhealthy food is all just making us fat and sick. You've heard of high fructose corn syrup? That's a great product. It's been demonized to the nth degree. We're all fat and, and diabetic because of HFCS. Let's go back one more slide there. Behave there, computer. Yeah, so we'll, we'll go from our credibility gap right into what I think may be your uh, big topic of discussion for this session. I want to give you a brief history of HSUS because I have a brief history with them as an ag journalist in Ohio. I've been covering their efforts to define not only the role of animals in our life, but who gets to say what the roles of animals are. I've been covering it for a few years uh, from an objective journalist point of view because they came to Ohio. Um, we'll talk about what happened there. Once upon a time, you know, HSUS was part of this kind of broader uh, humane movement um, that had, I think, some laudable and, and lofty ideals that we all probably share. Let's make sure animals aren't abused, neglected, and that sort of thing. A lot of folks, as you know, think that HSUS is all about saving the unwanted, unloved, and neglected puppies and kittens of the world, and they, they make it an analogous thing with uh, the local animal shelters of whatever stripe. We, we know that's not exactly true, that this movement is a very big business to the hundreds of millions of dollars tunes. A lot of donations coming in, a lot of money going out, and a variety of different things. It is a big business with tax-exempt status. They target not only animal agriculture, which is how I got um, involved in the, the journalistic discussion we're going to have, but also farming, rodeo, hunting, and the circus, so things that many of us have an interest in. Looking at the brief history legislatively, my kind of exposure goes back to 2002 when I started covering their efforts to use state ballot initiatives. I think state ballot initiatives as an aside and as a wannabe political scientist are a very dangerous tool that I think as a society we have to learn or figure out how to either fix or kill. Uh, I, I don't know how you get that genie back in the bottle, but speaking as someone who lives in a state where we have two to five ballot initiatives on the November ballot every single year now, it's really a dangerous way to modify your state's constitution uh, and, and really enshrine some things that shouldn't be in a state's constitution, regardless of whether you support them or not. After Florida, the organization moved to Arizona, and then November, they had their biggest victory to date in California. You'll notice that with Florida and Arizona, Florida and Arizona are interesting. They were tackling gestation stalls, which is still an issue we're fighting today. And those are states that don't have huge hog production numbers. So they wanted to rack up some easy victories by going to states where there wasn't an active, engaged, and vocal pork production industry to, to fight back, so to speak. California is an interesting state. Prop 2. Anyone remember Prop 2? Oh, wow. Okay. So I don't need to give you the brief history. You, you have a better industry, insight into Prop 2. The numbers on Prop 2 were really interesting, though. It passed by a really an overwhelming majority in today's electoral terms. The problem, as you know, with Prop 2 was its vagueness. Setting aside any philosophical differences we have about whether or not we should be dictating to producers how they produce food, the, the statute itself in legislative terms, very vague. How do you define whether an animal can do all of these things? Lie down, stand up, turn around, do cartwheels, play poker, have friends over for drinks. I don't know how, how you define that using the legislative language that was in the ballot initiative. We do know this. Huge coalitions, right, on both sides of the issue, pro and con, literally millions of dollars spent trying to pass and defeat this uh, issue. 
Following Prop 2, the organization decided it was ready to come to the Buckeye State. Because let's face it, California, while being the number one agricultural state in the country, isn't a real farm state, is it? At least not if you don't live here. If you live east of the Mississippi River, California has what? Liberals, hippies, and actors. I mean, you know, I love California, by the way. I got married in San Diego. My wife and I flew out here. This is one of our favorite places. Southern California is one of our favorite places to visit. And, and we have, like, nothing in common with anyone who lives in Southern California, right? <laughs> no, no, I'm, 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 I jest. But if you're a farmer in the Corn Belt who raises corn and soybeans, cattle, and hogs for a living, you do not think of California as the number one farm state in the country. And yet, California has 300 different crops, commodities, and livestock products raised here just literally thousands of farmers and, and hundreds of millions of dollars of economic output through agriculture. California's problem, however, and I, I had a chance earlier this year to interview the president of the California Farm Bureau, is because farmers here grow so many different things in so many different and unique microclimates, not just in the meteorological sense, but in the geopolitical sense, it, it's, it's hurting cats to try to get everyone around the proverbial table. I, I had a, a huge epiphany when talking to that farmer about how you get together almond producers and dairy farmers and fruit and vegetable producers and so y'all are forging an alliance here and you know how challenging that can be at times. This is even within one industry, agriculture. We think of agriculture as a monolith and in this state it couldn't be farther from the truth. All right, Ohio, we needed HSUS that is, needed to get a farm state, a real farm state, because what's the ultimate goal? To go to Congress to enact sweeping federal legislation, which we know is kind of in process at this point. Ohio battled back with issue two, putting in the state constitution, the Ohio Livestock Care Standards Board, a board of 13 individuals representing a wide variety of stakeholders who then would have the constitutionally mandated and legislatively independent power and responsibility to essentially set the standards by which animals have to be cared for. Now, this is a pretty interesting body. It's a very um, deliberative body that, that meets, has had a number of public hearings, and have set down the regulations that then the Department of Agriculture and other state agencies have to enforce. Now they're dealing with the uh, exotic and, and dangerous wild animal trade. Uh, that, that has been something of a lightning rod issue for the last year or so. At the time this board was appointed, it wasn't really an issue at all. At least we didn't know it was an issue. It was one of these things that the parties at the table essentially traded away. How did we get the Care Standards Board? Issue two passed in Ohio by, isn't he dreamy? I just love this guy. <laughs> we'll get to Waniac here in a minute. But the, the Care Standards Board was kind of an interesting beast when it came about. Um, after issue 2-1 by such considerable margins in Ohio, 60 some percent, HSUS threatened to run a ballot initiative essentially to make the care board do its bidding. What do we know about HSUS? Huge money that Ohio agriculture doesn't have. We, we can't put down $10 million to fight against a ballot initiative. Internal polling told us that HSUS ballot initiative probably would have won with 60 percent of the vote, just the same as the agriculture-led ballot initiative had passed the year before. That seems kind of incongruent, right? And yet you and I can both on the face, I think, accept that, yep, that's probably the way the voter would have thought about that and decided that, of course, it only makes sense that we want the animals to be happy and healthy and turn around and stand up and have space and not be abused by these farmers who beat their animals for fun and profit. That's, that's the emotional, yeah, for a hobby, right, exactly, yeah. That's why we have them. <laughs> so we don't beat our kids, we beat our hogs instead, you know. <laughs> crazy, but that's the emotional angle we're fighting. Here's a, here's a good example. This gestation stall issue. I'm going to step away from ballot initiatives for a minute to talk about one specific practice that is still in the news. Retailers are moving away from gestation stalls like rats from a sinking ship. Why are they doing this? They're doing it because HSUS has systematically targeted the practice. They've passed these state ballot initiatives in a handful of states across the country. And it's very easy to show a really ugly video of a sow in an iron cage, essentially, um, unable to stand up and turn around. Now, the animal scientists in the room can give you a litany of reasons of why animal scientists, ag engineers, and farmers design gestation stalls. Gestating sows are not pleasant creatures. 
They really aren't. Um, you, you think of pigs and you think of Piglet and Porky Pig and they're wonderful happy creatures who skip about. In the real world, it is not the case. In the real world, gestating snails are something like grizzly bears, only covered in, in muck and, and, and with lots of big bristles on their back, and they're not afraid to let you know that they're not happy about the fact that you're wanting to mess with their offspring. So we use technology, essentially, to solve a labor management issue, an animal husbandry issue. Uh, we had more and more employees coming onto hog farms who did not grow up on hog farms, uh, a good percentage of immigrant labor in the livestock industry who perhaps didn't grow up in the commercial style livestock operations of the modern era and we're trying to produce more pork to feed more people with the same amount of resources, right? So you have this animal husbandry issue. Sows are nasty and they will hurt our workers if our workers aren't really, really good at animal husbandry. So let's figure out a way to design facilities that can help solve our management issue. That's what we do, right? You have a management issue, you use technology to solve it. We solved it and now we realize that maybe the solution we had no longer fits the times. And so now what the industry is doing in a way is figuring out how does it, how does it transition away if it wants to from gestation stalls back to group housing and how do we shore up our now our technological issue through animal behavior and husbandry. It's not going to be an easy process. A number of producers are already doing it, but the question at the moment is who gets to dictate the terms? Right now, through the pressure on the retailer, HSUS is dictating the terms. The industry is being very resistant. As an objective journalist, I will tell you I'm not sure that's the smartest move that the industry is making, but I'm not at the table when those decisions are being made, so my opinion counts about that much. The retailer is an interesting part of the conversation though because it illustrates this question of perception being reality. If you're a retailer and, and you have an HSUS extremely well funded and as you know very good at messaging and being on point and using pictures to tell a story, you don't want to screw around, do you? If your choice is to fight with HSUS and lose potentially millions of dollars and, and thousands of customers or say I've got 15 years to figure out how to phase this practice out of my food supply, fine. The farmer will do what I tell him because I buy his product. That's how it works, okay? I want to tell you a story. <clears throat> any vegetarians in the room? Thank you for being honest. Any, <laughs> any, any, any vegans in the room? I want, you, I want to tell you about my friend Faye. Faye I call the closet vegetarian. Uh, Faye and I went to high school together, my, has been my best friend for 20 years or more. Faye uh, lived in town. I was a farm kid. She was a city kid, even though we grew up in a, in a small town. And, and Faye is the closet vegetarian of my life because she would be a vegetarian if meat didn't taste so damn good. <laughs> I mean, when I told her that chicken was meat, it was a real problem for her because she thought that by cutting out beef and pork, she was, you know, so and then she just realized this wasn't going to work for her. The problem for Faye isn't that she has some philosophical issue with eating meat, it's that she's just a little squishy and uncomfortable about how meat gets from being a cow on my farm to being a steak on her plate. It's not that she has anything against me as a farmer for raising food animals. Some people have a philosophical issue with that, and that's okay. We can have that discussion and disagreement, I think, as rational adults. So Faye calls me one day, and she says, Andy, did you watch Oprah today? I'm, I'm just guessing you can figure out my response to that question. No, no, Faye dear, I, I didn't watch Oprah yesterday or the day before that 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 or, well, ever. I have this hate-hate relationship with Oprah going back to the, the Texas hamburger debacle of 1990, whatever year it was. Some of you will remember that, some of you won't. I think Oprah is the most powerful and sometimes uh, most irresponsible quasi-journalist in the known universe, but let's... <laughs> And I think it's because I'm a journalist that I have that hate-hate relationship with her because she has, I respect her immensely because of the brand she's created and the platform she has. And sometimes I just think she practices journalistic malpractice and that bothers me. So I knew what Faye was talking about when she said, did you watch Oprah yesterday? I had heard through social media, which is a great tool we'll talk about in a minute, that Oprah was doing a story about where meat comes from. 
And as you might well understand, most folks in my sector of the, the professional universe were, they were pulling out the pitchforks and torches. Because if I said to you, Oprah is going to do a story on your particular industry, you just assume that it was going to be a hit piece, right? Yeah. Her track record is such that we had no reason to believe that where meat comes from would be a fair and balanced discussion. So I hadn't watched the show, but fortunately for me, Faye said those magic words, I've DVR'd it for you. <laughs> well, as it turns out, I went home for the weekend, back to the home farm, and my sister-in-law, also a city girl, but married my brother, who is, who is the farmer in our family and a John Deere tractor mechanic, she said, Andy, did you watch Oprah this week? <laughs> Hello, Lord. <laughs> so I said, no, no, I didn't. And she said, well, it's okay. I DVR'd it for you. And so I have these two city women in my life who DVR'd this show for me. It's a sign, right? I watch it, and I will tell you it's probably the best documentary on food production I have seen in my life. If, if you did not see the Oprah Where Meat Comes From story, you, you have a hard time appreciating where I come from. But... Oprah did more in a 48-minute television program to help people be comfortable with how food, particularly meat, is produced in our country than I think I've done in 30 years. And I'm not sure if that says more about me or more about her, but it's something I grapple with every day. My, my friend Faye, the closet vegetarian, on the phone with me before I've watched this show, starts rattling off terms to me that are like slogans, jargon, and and buzzwords from my industry. She's like, well, did you know that they keep the lighting dark in the processing facility and that the animals go through a, a Temple Grandin designed facility so that they're, they're handled calmly and humanely? And did you know they don't really make a sound as they're going into the kill box and, and they stun them so the animals are senseless when, uh, when they're actually exsanguinated? And she's rattling off all these words like, holy crap, what has Oprah done? And where's my friend? My friend, the closet vegetarian, walked away from seeing a video shot at Cargill's Meat Solutions plant in Fort Morgan, Colorado, with a totally different appreciation and respect for how we handle end of life for food animals in this country. By giving them a humane death, we respect that relationship that I think, uh, and I don't want to get theocratic on you, but I, you know, I, I'm a Bible believer who thinks that God established the role of animals in our life. That shapes my worldview on this issue. You don't necessarily have to have that worldview to share that animals have a role in a relationship that can be of a food production persuasion. I'll check my watch here because we have a lot of slides to get through and I don't want the program to get behind. The take home message I want you to have from Oprah and my friend the closet vegetarian is this. Do you know how many meat plants Oprah's people had to call before they got to Cargill who said yes? Any guesses? 24. Cargill Fort Collins was, or Fort Morgan, was number 24 on the list. Everybody said no. And if you're everybody, why wouldn't you say no? Here's the thing that Cargill has going for it, and I love Cargill, it's a great company, but Cargill's a privately owned company. They're the largest privately owned company in the known universe. Because they're privately held, they can take the chance, in a sense, by letting Oprah come into their facility because their stock price isn't going to go to hell tomorrow if Oprah does a hit job. That's not to say they didn't take a huge, huge financial risk because they did. If this went belly up and Walmart said, we got to distance ourselves from all these products that we carry in our stores that your facilities produce, woe be to Cargill. But because they weren't a publicly traded company, I think they had a little more flexibility and latitude in the industry. That, those are my words, by the way, as an, as an analyst. That's not, Cargill didn't tell me that, that that's why they did it or what allowed them to do it. But I interviewed the plant manager, and you see um, her in the two pictures on the right. If I hadn't been dating my wife at the time, I'm pretty sure I would have been looking at moving to Colorado because the plant manager, beautiful and brilliant young woman who I think handled Oprah and handled Michael Pollan and handled the author of The Veganist, um, whose name escapes me, handled them really brilliantly from a public relations standpoint. Completely transparent, communicated shared values. You know, I live in this community, so I care about the same things the people around my plant care about. My kids eat the same food that is produced at my plant. One thing after another that she said was just sincere, 
communicated on that pl platform of shared values and really hit home with the moms and other opinion leaders who watch Oprah's television show. Let's shift gears for a minute. If it's on the internet, it has to be true, right? This is one of the things that we're fighting, I think, as an interest alliance, if you will. Who cares about social media? This is one of the big questions, you know, that for folks of, an age, of a certain age, and I'm thinking um, my mother, for example, not interested in the least at social media. My mother-in-law thinks social media um, is the ruination of society as we know it and that the world is going to a hell in a handbasket because her son-in-law is on Facebook and Twitter. No, she really does. I'm not kidding. I didn't make that up. <laughs> you fall into two camps in, in social media. Either you're in the camp that says social media is irrelevant to me because I don't care what everybody had for breakfast because that's the perception, right? That, that dithering idiots like myself are up posting pictures of the bagel they had in the hotel lobby this morning for breakfast. On the other hand, you have those folks who think that social media is the end-all, be-all gift from the heavens that has really allowed us to communicate in new and different ways and to get our message out there without the traditional media filter, which is a blessing and a curse, let me tell you. Uh, a couple of little cartoons for you. This is the evolution of, of social media, if you will, going back from the postal service in Persia before the birth of Christ all the way through to Twitter and so on. And, you know, one of these things I loved on here, I love that it talks about the social media uh, development starting with the postal service because to my grandmother, social media is if I send her a card or a letter. How many of us send cards and letters anymore? Half? Half the room, I think. Hands went up. Um, I'm one of the few people I know that still sends handwritten cards. My handwriting's horrible, but I got these nice little stationary cards because I know this, that if I send you a handwritten note, I can say the same darn thing I would have said in an email or a Facebook post. You know which one of those three things you will remember and you will, you will cherish or at least think warm and fuzzy things about, maybe even put it on your fridge for a day? I know which one of those things that will be. That's not to say that I care less if I send you a message on Facebook or shoot you an email. I do those things too. Social media has really changed. Here's kind of an explanation for those of you who are not social media mavens about the different social media platforms. How many of us are on Facebook? Show of hands. Audience participation. Thank you. How many of us are not on Facebook? You are at least aware that there is a thing called the Internet and that there are websites that allow you to... It is 2012, right? My dad, for the love of God, is on Facebook and he uses it from his iPhone. What is wrong with the rest of you, you know? Okay. Uh, any Twitterers in the room? My buddy Joe says it this way. He says, I'm a twit who tweets on Twitter. Talking about himself, not about me, but I always thought that's a cute, that's a cute uh, <coughs> saying. Facebook is a big business. Facebook were at a country, as of a year ago, would be the number three country in the world. And the only reason it's not bigger is because China blocks the thing, right? <laughs> if the Chinese were on Facebook, God knows what the, what the planet would look like today. Facebook is also big business. Look at the amount of money. If time and money are the same thing. Now, personally, I will tell you, time and money are inversely related. People say time is money. Time and money are inversely related. You will spend more of one to save the other. But this is how much time people spend on Facebook. And I love this the little dog. You read the, read the caption there. Get a life. The problem that we have with social media in agriculture is that social media starts with telling a story. It lets us get past the media. And it lets us kind of build on these shared values, right? That's a good thing. But it quickly goes too far. My friend Will is a dairy farmer, and, and Will posted this the other day. I, I love seeing those cows grazing the green grass. Now think about this from a consumer standpoint. And maybe you're, as a non-ag person, maybe you'll have this immediate response. My gut response to this is, if your milking herd hasn't spent the last few mornings on grass, where were they? If they're not on grass, where do you have them? Are you one of those giant factory corporate mega farmers who keeps your animals locked up in airplane hangar looking buildings like Area 51? Christian is uh, a hog farmer. She's probably the poster child for social media and agriculture this day. Testifies before Congress on a regular basis. She puts up this little factoid. I didn't grow up on a hog farm. I don't have any personal experience in a sow operation. What's my response to this? B.S. Uh, you can tell me that you hold up a pig by its hind legs, but if I don't see it for myself, that can't possibly be accurate, right? That's, that's a consumer's gut response. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
you, you, you're one of those people that throws your pigs around like they're bean bags. I've seen it on an HSUS video. <laughs> Back to Will, this is another one. This is the one that really just grinds my grits when farmers post stuff like this. That's life on a farm. You know, you work no matter what the weather. Well, guess what, folks? I got to go to work if it rains. Cry me a frickin' river. <laughs> what really chaps me the most is the farmers, you have seen this bumper sticker, I'm sure. Had a good meal today? Thank a farmer. I'm a farmer. I used to have that bumper sticker on my car. You know what I don't ever see? Drive a nice car? Thank a union worker. House didn't burn down? Thank a firefighter. I don't see those kind of bumper stickers. Agriculture is the only industry where we want to be patted on the back for doing a job that pays us money. And it's, a, I think, one of the reasons we have a disconnect between producers and consumers. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these, but there are a lot of people on social media who really don't like us either. And it's easy to get in the mud and fight with these people. I used to fight with this guy from Vermont. He's, um, Rob is about as kooky as a whole box of Cocoa Puffs. Um, and I used to fight with him all the time about a variety of issues. And finally, I decided that the thing about fighting with a hog is that you can't help but get in the mud. So if I don't want to get in the mud and end up covering the same dirt he is, I just got to let him go. I'm not going to change his mind. Chances are, the X number of thousand people that follow him on Twitter, I'm not going to change their mind either. He's not going to change my mind, and the X number of thousand people that follow me aren't going to change their mind either. So we've got to communicate to that roughly 94% in the middle who aren't promised either side of the debate. And too many times we spend focused on the other side. The other side, we're not going to win. So the middle ground, how do we do it? For farmers, it's simple. We think about food, not production. We think about pork chops, not pigs. We think about the consumer in terms of having a tasty eating experience, in terms of being able to go to the grocery store and buy the food that their kids want to eat, that's how we have to think. Instead, we think about production units, dollars per acre, pigs per sow per litter. We think in very economic, analytical, scientific, fact-based terms, and we're losing left and right. YouTube proofing agriculture is a phrase I coined in a column more than a year ago. We have to YouTube proof our relationships with animals. This, I think, applies to those of us no matter what. I know my friends in the circus industry can, can take this to heart. I know folks who are in the dog breeding business can take this to heart. I have a, the breeder. I showed you Rody, my, my little pup to be there in the first slide. Somebody stopped by our house the other day under the guise of being a carpet cleaner. And I started asking a lot of really probing and unusual questions about her pack of elk hounds and her breeding operation. She was scared to her wit's end that this was a person who was looking to report some humane abuse that was going to have the authorities come and pulling her dogs out of her house and, and ruining her pack. Because we've all heard those stories, right? And probably even know people who have been involved in those really tragic and heartbreaking situations. How do we present what we do in a way that it could be live streamed on the internet 24-7 and not cause a fuss? If, as a farmer, I can say with certainty, I wouldn't mind you putting a webcam in my barn 24-7, I'm doing it right. If I say to myself, I don't know if I'd want you to see, insert whatever the activity is here, you're doing it wrong. And it has to change. Cost of doing business today. Cost of doing business today. Here's a good example, Penn State's dairy folks. When sending animals to commerce, ask yourself, is this something I would feed my own family? The dairy industry is notorious for sending cows to harvest that should have been sent to the meatpacking plant two years ago. And that's where you see some of these videos show up on the internet of these cows that look like they can't walk and they get pushed around by skid steers. It's because they can't walk. And they couldn't walk two years ago. And some really irresponsible people in my industry have got to figure that out and clean it up, or the market will do it for them. Another example, my friend Mike. I like this one. This is a good way to use social media to communicate what farmers do. Hey, it's going to get cold this weekend. I'm going to put out some extra hay. This guy cares about his cows. You can't misinterpret that. Those things are okay to do on social media. 
College students are getting more engaged in the discussion. The problem with those of you who work with college students know this. College students, college students are kind of like playing with fireworks. You light the fuse and you better point it in the right direction because otherwise somebody's getting burned. <laughs> The, the slide on the left there is an example of that. I, I absolutely hate this campaign. There's a group out of, um, I can't remember, what's, uh, what school? Cal Poly. Yeah, 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 that, thank you. Uh, the people who are behind the Cal Poly thing are great people. I, we're friends on Facebook, and I love them to death because they're doing something. I just thought that this particular campaign speaks to the wrong perception. Because if I hear this acronym and I'm not of a certain age, I'm offended because I know what it means and you're being cute with words and I don't like that. And I think that the consumers that we're trying to reach aren't going to like it either. On the other hand, you know, the stuff on the other side is kind of warm and fuzzy. And, and I will tell you, I gave this presentation to uh, a consumer audience Thursday night and when I shared with them those production numbers at the beginning about how much more food we're getting from the same amount of farming, wow, you could just see the recognition on their face and that, that resonated with them. But it doesn't always, okay? So it's about different approaches. Here's the solution as I get into my wind-up pitch. It's all about a paradigm shift. We have to start thinking in terms of we, not me. We have to start thinking in terms of what happens when we get questions from our non-farm friends, like my friend Faye, the closet vegetarian. Temple Grandin will probably talk about this in her presentation because Temple talks about uh, the wedding guest experiment. If, if you took five people from your wedding reception to your farm or to your, your processing facility if you're in the meat biz or to your dog breeding operation or to your circus behind the scenes, whatever it is, would five people from your wedding reception be okay with what was happening behind the scenes? And if the answer is no, kind of like my YouTube question, you have to change it. YouTube proofing agriculture, though, isn't about a Band-Aid fix. It's about values. We value our animals. We care about our animals. If we don't start with that very basic underpinning, then it's just window dressing, and people see through window dressing. It's not about a good, slick PR campaign, but it's about showing what we really believe and who we really are. The food-centered paradigm, again, it's about the production. It's about the product and not the production. It's about the product we produce and the eating experience the consumer has and that they can feel warm and fuzzy about it. It's not about how we got there. It's about communicating on that deeper level. All right, as you update your attitude and you talk to your farmer friends to ask questions that you need answers to, because I'm guessing you, if you're not a farmer, have questions you need answers to. A couple resources for you, my website, uh, go and read some of my past columns there. Really encourage you to do that. Google for Cargill, or uh, on my website, search for Cargill, and you'll go back and read the stories about the Oprah episode or search for Oprah or whatnot, and go back and listen to some of the interviews I did with the people from Cargill. Really enlightening stuff. Feedstuffsfoodlink.com is our kind of consumer outreach website. And I'm giving you a fabulous life-changing prize. A free four-week trial to Feedstuffs, the weekly newspaper for agribusiness, so you can read some of the things that the farmers I write to every day are reading about. You can do it online, username, animal, all lowercase, password, interest, all lowercase. Go to feedstuffs.com, click sign in on the top right hand corner, username and password, free, four weeks. Say thank you, Andy. Thank you. Oh, you're so good. I'll leave you this with President John F. Kennedy. I'll be uh, moderating the panel this afternoon. We'll take some questions from you then. But I really appreciate your attentiveness and good luck as you help move your paradigm through the rest of the conference.